Hello everyone, today we talk about the juridical revival of the 11th century. I began this series of videos on medieval law on request, hmm? but the more I go on with this, this is like the fourth or the third, I don't actually remember, uh, and the more I realize, the more I, I recall actually when I studied this stuff back in the day, how important this really is, I mean how much need I think uh, there is to know this part of history, uh, which is actually way more complicated than the one I'm telling here. The here it's just at a manualistic level, it doesn't even scratch the surface of what it actually is, academically speaking. But it's one of the most overlooked um, uh, topics, I think, and especially for medieval history, for reasons that stem from general, you know, uh, lack of interest, or, or maybe presence of interest, but lack of actual knowledge and education on on medieval history proper, um, and also certain prejudices towards the era that uh, even in manuals of of law, like I don't know, medieval and modern or modern law, you know, they address uh, medieval law as a sort of um, in this longer kind of modernistic perspective towards the evolution of you know towards the state as the only source of of law essentially um, as an an imperfect system. I mean something that had to evolve deterministically, teleologically towards like our days, right, where um, things are naturally very, very different. This is one of the great mistakes that we, we do, not all manuals are good in this regard, and I'm talking seriously about the Greek, I mean, even some of the most refined ones that are not um, specifically concentrated on medieval law, are look at medieval law as just as an incomplete form of what would uh, happen next. Right, and they don't take into consideration actually the massive accomplishments that medieval civilization had in this field and why they work. Right, uh, the the general mindset is you know when when have to make these comparisons. First of all, you know you may answer why would you do that. Secondly, it's basically putting all th these achievements on a line and saying, oh look, here in more modern times everything was better than before. So the, 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 the first things do not matter because on my scale, you know, uh, that's, that's another word that kind of sucked, right? And this is how many people look at, at the Middle Ages actually like and they don't take in consideration what it, it actually meant for the time. I mean, how effective, in this case, in the juridical field, these measures, for example, were, were functional. Or they actually regulated society um, in, in a context that was m way more difficult, in fact, to control than what would, would happen next, right? So uh, you have to evaluate, this is valid for medieval history in general, everything given its own context, its own standards, right? You, you can't um, make comparisons starting from two different bases and proving something about it, like, you know, this was better, this was worse in absolute terms. It doesn't make sense historically speaking. This is valid for every single aspect of reality, right? And of historical reality, not only. Um, so, what we, we, we completely bypass these topics because nobody cares. You know, when we think of Middle Ages, many people also like it because, ah, you know, there were swords and axes and people butcher each other and it's cool because there are knights and things like But, you know, when it ca takes to uh, notaries, lawyers, judges, ah, it's boring, right? It's just paper, just guys uh, studying and doing administrative stuff. And nobody cares, right? This is also the other kind of wild kind of... Mm, primitive uh, approach to, to history that, that does exist, um, unfortunately, is very widespread um, uh, at many levels, at least, uh, and that we continue on to, to, to experience, right? And this is also not a very bad thing, because actually when you look at these societies, um, you, you realize that s some were actually more advanced than others. I mean, when you see, for example, a juridical system that effectively works, that is, is more developed, it's more advanced, it's more regulated, what well, normally that society has accomplished also at other levels, including the political, the military, the economical, the social one, actually more than others that are just about, let's say, this form of action, right? Let's be honest about this, because I come exactly from the generation that started, you know, the talking about these things on the internet and about medieval history in a kind of, a in, um, you know, maybe not in my case, but generally speaking with an entertaining or either educational um, aim. Uh, and, and everything started essentially from 
you know, people of my age, uh, often male, and uh, about, you know, video games, about warfare, which I also play, so I, it's not a criticism about anything, but that we have the strong bias that the Middle Ages is cool just is because it's about knights and, and, and things. And I'm a military historian myself, so that's <laughs> what I study for a living. But still, you know, take it from me. I, I, you must know about this stuff. I mean, you can't uh, say you properly know how that world worked politically and therefore militarily included um, without knowing how effectively society was regulated as a whole. Because from studying these things, as you can't know, of course, from studying the military stuff and whatever, you you understand a lot, and, and of course, in its own specific, um, let's say, environment and context, uh, it gives a, a lot more information that you can mix with others. And I'm sorry for this rant slash vent and slash introduction that I usually don't make, especially in these topics, but by preparing this video today, I was looking at this stuff and saying, wow, this was really something. Right, and on Schwerpunkt, coming to the point finally, we have discussed on several occasions, if you go in the medieval society playlist, you find all the kind of socio-economical stuff, right? So if you want a bit of context, but I don't think you need it, because you know, if you follow me, I think you already know, but not thanks to me, thanks to the fact that probably you have a higher uh, historical interest in knowledge by yourself, uh, what the 11th century has been. It's this moment of great cultural and economical revival, that in fact in itself it's not even about the 11th century only right these societies were you know transforming from previous times we we are uh, rediscovering in middle ages and uh, the, the enormous importance especially the 10th century had um, many levels so and and concentrating also on other you know aspects that came later but definitely the 11th century is this moment of great um, revival great growth and expansion especially western europe um, this is, you know, growth is something that affects more or less the, the, all the ra rest of Eurasia. Um, expansion is something different here, and mm, telling the history of law shows you a bit what this practically means, right? Um, this video is essentially aimed at showing you how in Western Europe, specifically from uh, Central Northern Italy, there was this massive... Uh, re um, readaptation and and recovery in general of of Roman law, right? For purposes that were not like copying Roman stuff. Um, this is completely out of the mind of, of of people who were working here, especially as jurists, as lawyers, um, as judges, etc. In the administration, in politics, they had eminently practical aims, right? And um, they, they were intertwined, as we'll see, with a lot of big deals, including the investiture controversy that had a dramatic importance even in juridical fields. Actually, it's probably the sing probably m one of the most single most important factors in that point in, in the history of uh, medieval law and even beyond, because the traditions that were set at this point in the 11th century would essentially survive on, like for, uh, in, in certain cases, up to Napoleonic times. Um, and uh, and definitely there is a still a legacy beyond that, um, but that uh, at this point in fact didn't just take Roman law passively. This is another great m prejudice and misunderstanding, and uh, which is definitely a mistake we make all the time about the Middle Ages. That you know, since there was stuff that was taken from previous times, it essentially was a copy of it. Be for making you know the actual the, the the contemporary society worked because it didn't work. Well, this wasn't absolutely like this, because this society was heading to become actually something even more developed than the ancient one, the classical one. And the proof of this is that the Middle Ages, um, as the Renaissance would do, because the Renaissance is essentially a medieval creation, um, which is another perspective you rarely hear. I, I would say. Um, took it and improved what was the classical knowledge. They didn't take it take it passively and, and in the way it modified it, um, rendered available very important changes that are at the base of our own, you know, modern um, one of the pillars, right? Together with the ancient world for sure. Uh, um, you know, that this is very important to stress. But of, of our Western civilization, <coughs> whatever you want to call it. And um, so 
talking about this phase, um, we can say that mm, from some time we have um, assessed, we have recognized that there was a, a, a new great interest for the Justinian and code that was developed in the uh, central and northern areas of the Italian peninsula during the 11th century, right? We made videos about the birth of universities recently, we have talked in fact about medieval law in, th in that context because universities were born as a matter of fact exactly for this, right? Uh, there were other faculties like of theology that emerged from previous um, school ecclesiastical schools and essentially the only form of education that existed at this point I mean a structural one came from the church right and in fact even the same recovery um, of Roman law that was essentially a lay uh, phenomenon especially in the second half of the 11th century actually stemmed from the very close contact that notaries lawyers and other jurists had with ecclesiastical administration that in the Italic kingdom specifically in here was in charge of the cities because the Italian peninsula was a region of cities right differently from other parts of Europe um, that um, were working essentially through this set of specialists that uh, had actually a great tradition uh, in their in their past as well, you know, in the previous centuries, the Italic legal systems were very advanced. Right, one day we will make a video specifically on the on Longobard Law, for example. Where this, as we will see today, much of this paradoxically stemmed from right. Uh, this is utter prejudice, right? Roman r law arrives and surpasses this, you know, uh, Germanic laws that kind of were primitive and just a list of stuff that didn't have systematic institution like categories etc um, no because actually um, the people that in Europe revived Roman law making becoming effectively one one massive pillar of medieval and modern European juridical traditions were Longobardists that were essentially lawyers that studied the uh, the Longobard Edict that was still in force in here, even if the Longobard Kingdom, as you know, Longobard rule as such, didn't didn't exist anymore. But we'll see all this a bit later, right? Um, and uh, I don't remember where I was going with this, but just remembering that this area is pers is particularly important. We will make other videos also to understand why this happened in Italy, why uh, eventually, you know, it had such such a development in the area. But for now. Just remember that, in particular, in the second half of the 11th century, um, um, we assist to this m moment of m significant preparation for the f the eventual flourishing of the juridical science, especially in the following century. Right, already telling it from the end of the century itself. And this is methodologically another very important thing to remember, that is, when we see that s something exists, right, we have evidence, we have uh, sources that tell us that something existed, it's obvious that this thing had not been born at that specific time. If, if you find a legal system that is already capable of integrating Roman law and up, up applying it um, in public tribunals, etc., you realize that that's something that has began before. So that's why it's m very important to look at the origins of this. And at this point, we're looking at rather at the moment in which we can track this through actual sources and evidence, but that shows a, uh, show us in turn that a lot had already been done before. And it's kind of frustrating that, in fact, we don't know more about this simply because we don't have enough sources. But, you know, welcome to history, to most of history, essentially. Um, and, um, and, in fact, it, it's very important to remember in this context that during the long history of the early Middle Ages, the study of law was maintained alive, right? Um, even if in kind of m simpler forms that were definitely um, apt to the specific political and social structures of the time, right? You don't need an extremely sophisticated um, a juridical system like the Roman one for a society that is not the the ultra developed one it had been I I in the past, right? You need something that works for a society that that is simpler, and this is not better or worse. And and the effectiveness of local law is like okay, measurable through 
exactly this accomplishment that surely uh, required less intellectual commitment from one side, but maybe they, they required in parallel something else, right? Like struggling for, you know, even putting something together once again. Um, and that that's an important thing. And the, the main, you know, the, the main evidence of this regard is early medieval times so essentially the virtual disappearance of Roman law or better of the Roman code in Western Europe like Roman law existed as a sort of customary law in certain areas that were intensely Romanized and it existed in parallel or overlapping in certain uh, codes especially um, in, uh, in even in the Ger Romano Germanic kingdoms right next to that were regulated by Germanic law chiefly um, but and and we have a, a, an enormous difficulty at that point of um, of tracking the mm, circulation of actual the Justinian end that is effectively the Theodosian code uh, at the time we, we knew it circulated in some ways you know it, it couldn't disappear it was m millions of people that had known in part that this thing had existed but you have to understand how functional this effectively was at the time you see uh, in the same way and therefore you can answer yourself why it was lost it didn't serve anymore right in the 11th century these things start changing because society becomes more complicated and it has to be regulated by more sophisticated systems once again um, and but what w what was was saying now is that actually the study of law was maintained alive in the schools of liberal arts that uh, were famously articulated in the trivium that is grammar dialectic and rhetoric in the quadrivium geometry uh, arithmetic astrology and music that had this um, ideal the word this ideal compendium of the in in encyclopedic form right think about is it or Seville uh, just like a model um, to, to keep together all the notions that were mm, that characterized the culture of the time and that provided in this sense elements of law in the teaching of rhetoric mm? this is particularly important it was a selection of ancient uh, knowledge of ancient wisdom rhetorical art for the same juridical th thinking right uh, and this was essentially it. So the thesis of the renewed interest for the Justinian N texts, right? So the texts that were codified uh, in the uh, 6th century, um, essentially uh, at the time of Justinian, that's what they're called like this, and uh, Emperor Justinian, uh, that were essentially this improvement of the Theodosian Code, of 4th century. Um, in, in, in the 11th century, I mean, as a, as a renewed interest, is mm, shared now by the most recent studies in general that connected especially with the reforming movement developed within the Roman Church, right? And it was interpreted uh, preeminently by the Pope Gregory the Seventh, uh, from which the Gregorian, in fact, the, 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 the reforms take their name because Gregorian reforms. Um, and as you know, we have discussed this as well, you know, I made an entire Popple um, play, uh, history playlist here, here of medieval Christianity and they overlap, frankly. Um, and it was this movement that mm, aimed at affirming the full independence of the church from every secular power, right? Enormous claim. This is another event that is dramatically overlooked. Many, arguably everybody knows what the Crusades were. Fewer people surely know what the Gregorian reforms were, and what th those were actually the ones that r literally changed the world, including because they started the Crusades <laughs> as a cause, right? So, um, and uh, and definitely if the, 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 the papacy had not been reformed in that way, that we, we would have not even known Crusades as they were. But as you understand, this, uh, the church at, at this point was acting pretty cleverly, naturally, the Roman Church at this point was very powerful. It had already established the, the links with the, um, the, the, let's call it the Germanic Empire, as such, and um, it was um, chiefly struggling, in fact, with th this one uh, rather than the Byzantines that were s still technically, especially in southern Italy, there, but were kind of more far, right? Um, with an empire that was at times an ally, at times 
an enemy, right? And that never actually, these two institutions um, as universal powers never um, in, let's say, disconfessed each other, right? The, the what we're trying to do, we're simply say, okay, these are your prerogatives, and these are mines, right? And they were naturally playing it very nastily because they both wanted like to reduce at the minimum everything uh, of the other. Um, but this is another topic we'll discuss uh, another time. And uh, the Roman Church was specifically now. I'm taking the, the perspective of the Church now because that's what we're talking about, without any favoritism whatsoever. Uh, was thinking at this point to be the direct and natural heir of the Majesty of Rome, in many ways that we can't explain now. Think about Constantine's donation. Think about the role that Rome had had in crowning the emperor. I mean, all all of that, but we, we can find other videos dedicated to this topic. Um, and at, at this point, the Roman Church was re vindicating within law, right, um, such fundament for its own claims, its own prerogatives, right? So it was a, a massive juridical um, activation to prove essentially the, the right of the Church to have to have its own full independence, which was very, very, you know, this stimulated enormously the ingenuity of these lawyers, because frankly, in the Roman world, and you can see this perfectly in the Byzantine Empire, it was the other way around, and actually, Roman law would be, especially during the 12th century, weaponized by the Holy Roman Emperors themselves, because actually Roman law says that it's the Emperor who's in charge, not um, the, uh, the Pope that you know, at the time wasn't even considered as a head of, of, of the general church, was just a council of bishops, right? And, um, but everything, this is, w once again, this is not a matter of which si whichever side was right or wrong. This is actually as about assessing the massive spin-off of juridical advancement was caused by this. Like, it was enormous. This was literally one of the founding and most dramatically influent and changing uh, events in Western history, right? And this is deeply overlooked, um, as far as I can can perceive. Of course, I I'm trying to to make it more incisive, but I, I really think we we lack generally uh, an awareness about this um, at a popular level, let's say. And uh, on the mm, as a consequence, this acknowledgement by recent historiography that now is you know we, we know it was like that substantially is also um, you know reflected on certain mm, researches of juridical polygraphical nature um, that brought several scholars actually even to redate um, certain mm, high medieval collections. Um, that were thought of being essentially uh, of earlier centuries and a kind of a closer connection with, with actual Roman law um, and dating them now instead at the 11th century, right? Because this was the stigma of modernistic kind of um, positivistic uh, prejudice that said, okay, well, it's impossible these guys wrote this stuff in the 11th century. It was something probably before that was kind of still one of the relics of Roman civilization. No, this was done now. And it was done from basically out of nothing. I mean, in terms of actual Roman, of relics of Roman history. Like, these guys had to literally begin to, to reconstruct ju Justinian and code and to, to put it together and to start using it um, in a in parallel, as we will see, with other laws that continue to be in force. This is also very important to understand. Um, there are recent studies of, like, not more than 15 years ago that have, for example, dated uh, such an important manuscript as the Summa Perusina, that is uh, a manuscript, so-called because it's in the Capitular Archive of Perugia in central Italy, um, the real title, which is uh, in Latin, uh, Ad Notationes Codicum Domini Justinian, right? And um, this is um, essentially being dated to, to the 11th, even if um, th the work um, was, um, was earlier than this. It was, was actually probably dated to the 
8th or 9th century, but the important thing is that this work began to be quoted once again at this time, right? Uh, then there is the most ancient manus complete manuscript of the Instituciones, of the Justinian and Code, known as the um, Codex of Bamberg, right? was composed uh, in the 11th century Rome. Hmm? Um, then um, there is the Turnay's uh, gloss of the to the institu Instituciones of, of, of the Codex that is datable to the late 11th century. The Cologne's gloss, because it's preserved in, in Cologne, manuscript W328, that is probably actually from the beginning of the 12th, and it's mm, still uh, a uh, you know, also gloss of the to the institutions. Let's call it this way now. Then it's probably dated to datable to the end of the 11th to the beginning of the 12th century. The Casamari gloss, once again, of the institutions preserved in the Sasorian manuscript 110 of uh, the National Library of Rome. Um, in the Beneventan area, that was also, by the way, of uh, Longobard tradition at that point, um, probably belonged both the so-called Collectio Gaudenziana, that is this, you know, pretty, it's not particularly orderly, but still important collection of passages from the novelle instead of the code, um, and, uh, and also titles of the Codex, and um, let's say synthesis of parts of the Instituciones, uh, which is collected. This is already we introduced this topic that is collected together with Visigothic uh, texts. Um, and for example, um, and, and in addition, once again, to actually to the same uh, to the same Collectio uh, Gaudenziana, there are the Lexio Legum. Um, that are s um, and then six chapters that quote m several sources, including the Summa Perusina that we have seen before, the Edictum Theodorici, or Theoderici, better, that was this um, disposition of law datable between 493 and 526 of uh, Theodoric, king of the Ostrogoths in, in Italy, um, and Visigothic and Longobard norms, once again. Then, to the 11th century, we could um, date the composition of the Epitome Codices that in the past had been attributed to the 7th, uh, 8th, or mm, a, fully a, a full 8th century. Um, then, in the 11th century, the Digestum, other parts of the Justinian Code, after centuries of silence, we, we, we can say, was once again quoted. Right, while at the end of the 11th century and the beginning of the 12th, we can date um, the uh, Parisian and Vatican manuscripts of the same uh, Justinian uh, collection. From one side, the historians of law have essentially pointed out how the first quotes of passages from the Justinian and collections are to be found in, in works that are born in this mm, in the frame of this renewed uh, ecclesiastical culture promoted by the Gregorian reform. Right, that's where they began essentially around. This is doesn't necessarily mean they were actually ecclesiastic lawyers, but because they, they already cooperated with, with laymen, right? But it's important that it's born in this milieu. Right, especially around bishops that effectively were uh, still at this point those who ruled the city, right before the com communes kicked in. Um, for example, the Collectio Canonum by Anselm of Lucca, that was um, friend and uh, most loyal, most faithful follower of Gregory the Seventh, um, presents um, some some hint of uh, some echo. Let's say of imperial texts, and in particular it quotes, after a very long time of, um, of, of silence, certain passages of the Authenticum, right? The Authenticum was this collection of 134 um, 
novella, in fact, as they were called, uh, that was eventually recognized as properly the, the authenticum, so the authentic, during the Middle Ages by, by the jurist Ir Irnerius. And we have made a video actually about him, so if you're interested, you can check that out. Then we have another work, the Polycarpus, right, uh, which is attributed to the Roman courier uh, Milieu, let's say, and the first uh, version of which is datable uh, to the years like 1104-1113, and and the second to the 1120-1123 years, roughly. Well, this work contains quotes taken from the institutions, from the code, and from the Epitome Juliani. Also with some, um, some actual reference to the Authenticum itself. And in addition, even, um, albeit in a kind of a limited way, to the Digestum. Hmm. And um, meaningful presence of passages of the Digestum is to be found also in the so-called Collectio Britannica that um, so-called actually because its um, only manuscript is present uh, in is to be found in London uh, this was a work composed in all likelihood in Rome in the last years of the 11th century and in this collection the fragments of the Justum are 93 right and they could derive in turn from a manuscript of the collection that could have been a sort of archetype um, either directly or indirectly of the um, of a manus or the Florentine manuscript it was one of the most important one one of the you know guide um, uh, texts for this further uh, developments later that carried Roman um, part of that Roman of the Roman code so the renewed circulation of texts of the Justinian and collections, by the way, seems also to have among its causes not just the cultural revival connected to the Gregorian reform, it was definitely, you know, very gave this enormous impulse to this, but also and obviously at this point, which in part is actually the same thing, um, certain, uh, let's say, urges that came from the same concrete praxis, right? Um, and this is where the 11th century that we know kind of better also in other fields kicks in in the sense that um, it's, it's the 11th century is considered, uh, considered a sort of a turning point in European economical life, right? And that is, was actually without precedence as such, right? Always thinking the Middle Ages were not inferior to Roman times, right? We've seen there was this brutal contraction of uh, mercantile traffics and uh, rural production had basically monopolized almost everything but at this point thanks to the courtly economy ha that had progressively began to store ever more surplus and put it once again in circulation therefore increasing investments and so on European continent together with other environmental factors etc was growing once again and expand um, so this first century of the new millennium is um, also characterized famously by a, a substantial demographic uh, increase and uh, that entailed mostly at the, uh, at the time basically a, a massive increase of um, peasant labor force right because most of the people like were, were, were actually peasants uh, and the consequent put to work of many lands that up to that point were left either um, uncultivated or maybe covered just in, in forests or swamps and so on. Um, and this in turn naturally triggered the growth of rural production that in turn once again caused a surplus of product um, and therefore of a work that at that point had to, you know, could produce goods, could be exported more easily, and that could create ever larger uh, international traffics. Mm -hmm. So this new dimension of mercantile relation is witnessed 
uh, by a sensible increase compared to the previous centuries of negotiable documents, right? That, that characterizes especially the Italian regions, and especially the center and north of Italy. Um, th this is actually, in fact, present since you know, um, s since previous centuries, uh, Italy maintained uh, this um, higher per capita wealth in Europe, higher literacy. So you can see, actually, even from longer bird times, from the 8th century, there is an increase of these practices of documents, and we're extremely lucky, actually, to have it preserved, like we, we have, compared to other areas of Europe, a, a very high, the actually the highest amount of, um, of actual documentation, especially of private documentation, uh, from Italy at this point. And such negotiable mm, papers basically begin to assume a different form from the past ones in the 11th century, because ever more frequently they began to repeat models and assumed formularies uh, that were actually the same of Roman tradition, with this aim of conferring a sort of normalization to the negotial to the negotial system this is how Nikolai actually put it and uh, and it's at this point that mm, ever more diversified constitutionary customary norms began to be inserted in these schemes in these patterns right and the origin of this customary uh, laws were was constituted at this point by what? Not by Roman law, actually, but by those popular laws of the various Germanic peoples, such as the Longobards, the Franks, the Alamanni, etc. Uh, actually, the same Roman tradition actually existed, but it was a transformed one, right? Um, so it, it, it definitely echoed part you know, of, of the legacy it had before, but this had been substantially modified and actually. Uh, it hadn't, uh, let's say, especially in certain, it depends on the areas fundamentally, but um, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe I was wrong to say that, that kind of it's not, was not present, but it was actually present, and it was also important, it just was minority on average, right? Uh, but important thing in, in here is, on the other hand, to, to realize that these schemes served in turn as models for the creation of new formularies that expressed negotiable relations of Germanic matrix. This is an important thing. That still these areas, especially um, the center and the north of Italy, well, those were Germanized in juridical culture, chiefly. That's why I said kind of Roman noir was less evident. Even if there were areas, important areas as Rome, as Ravenna, that were famously had been kind of Byzantine territory, or at least areas that had remained um, under, you know, under Roman customs longer, um, but here maybe we should, okay, we, we should make a dedicated video to understand how effectively, especially after the Carolingian times, uh, but not only actually, th there was, um, however, the increase of a mix, of, of the mix of these laws, right? Um, in previous centuries, there was a, m a sharper um, ethno-juridical separation in the sense that, not that people didn't mix, because they always did, but, you know, uh, there was a more unitary juridical identity, right? When you talk about ethnicity at this point, we're talking essentially about juridical identity, because a person that was a Longobard, let's say, was a Longobard because it responded to Longobard law, right? Um, after Car in Carolingian times, especially when the Longobard kingdom was uh, incorporated in the Carolingian Empire and actually maintained as such, institutionally speaking, was, was pretty damn advanced, civilly speaking. This is also another thing nobody actually ever talked about because, you know, the Longobards are just bloody mm, martyrs, barbarians. Actually, were the single most advanced, juridically advanced people in early medieval Europe, um, you know, among the Romano-Germanic ones, they, you know, they, they were uh, li uh, light years ahead from the Franks for in, in any type of s civil organization, and that's why the Franks maintained actually that institution because uh, those institutions because you know first of all that's where they began to rule in Italy, right? But what I'm talking about in here is that um, especially after the conquest, all the mess that happened, um, it was a mm, kind of a liberalization in some ways in the. Um, in the option of juridical 
identity. Like you could, for example, you could be a longer, but this, this is observable actually also in longer bird times. That, I mean, there were two longer birds, for example, that however could, if, if they consensually opted to sign a contract in a Roman, for, in a Roman way, so under or Roman law, actually, well, if they were both consensual, that was fine. Same, uh, the, the same longer bird justice actually recognized that as as fine. Same longer bird role uh, ac accepted it. And this thing's m m in in general. I don't remember actually if this is written in the uh, edictum of the longer birds, but we know by these private uh, documents that we we have from such an ancient time that this was done. And the important part of this is that it began from the bottom of society. It didn't begin because you know, it, it simply started to happen. Because people were getting richer, traffic's more intense, and therefore, you know, economy doesn't wait for government to, to regulate it, right? And uh, this happens already, right? It was accepted because everybody was fine with that, right? As long as um, trade continued and taxes were paid, it was perfectly fine. Um, so what what I'm trying to say here, uh, however, is that the the increase in the study of Roman law actually started from a dominant Germanic background, right? Um, these people, I especially in the north of Italy, in parts of the center, were actually feeling themselves still here in the 11th century, essentially al as longer birds, or at least they, uh, in the by the 10th century, they still did that, right? And they were known abroad like the Arabs, other people, they call them the Longobards, e even those Italians that actually were under Byzantine rule, right, because that was the impact that that domination had had, even in the south, actually, we were called before the Beneventan tradition in the southern Apennines, and that that's where, in fact, the Longob Longobards had ruled, and, and in those communities, actually, Longobard law would last uh, actually until the 19th century, this is how effective longer bird law really was to discipline such areas. It was definitely not, you know, simple or depressed. So even throughout the centuries, that law kept working, even for such advanced societies, compared to longer bird times. So just bear in mind how effective this mostly speaks for the effectiveness of longer bird law. But that's uh, that's exactly the point. It's from longer bird law that Roman law is recovered and integrated, not substituted. It's just by the 14th century, roughly, that Roman law becomes basically the, the static model. It's clarifies like many other things in the 14th century with a major crisis and everything, and that begins like to spread all over Europe. Kind of half of Europe functions with this inter massive introduction of Roman law codified by the Bolognese school. We made a, a video a um, couple of weeks ago actually talking about the Mos Gallicus and how this effectively was... Um, this tradition was present in, in France, for example, as well, next to customary law at the same time. So, it, as you understand, you understand the legacy here, the, the, the impact that it had on Western, uh, in Western Europe, at least. And so, in other words, um, I'll say this all started from, from lawyers that were actually like private professionals, right? It was lawyers that had a living by you know being hired by people who you know, denounced each other, <laughs> you know, sued each other, and went to court. Um, and once again, this is an area of the Italian peninsula is dramatically well documented in this regard. We we do know a lot of how it worked, locally speaking, in terms of justice, and we know how important it was because it also worked, right? Um, so this, let's call them practical jurists, um, began to look spontaneously to those laws, to those rights that constituted the matrix of certain of, of the of the uses of the customs that were enforced in their own regions to essentially um, um, giving juridical foundation, legitimization, and certainty to those negotiable relations that were becoming always more important in the practice.
the definition of the formularies and of the contractual models was therefore accompanied by this research, reconstruction and reading of texts that of those laws constituted certain source, right? And th this is the, the interesting part of the story that I think is, is deeply overlooked also when, when we think about the recovery of Roman law at this point is that what we have just said entailed that rather than looking at Roman law that definitely at this point kind of rocketed compared to the others because now they were actually getting the, 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 the material, they were, they were reconstructing it piece by piece, taking it from, from the Byzantine Empire, from areas that were these manuscripts circulated still, um, but also looking at the Longobard Frankish law, right? So the law of those two Germanic peoples that more than the others had uh, r rooted in the uh, central northern Italian territories. And therefore, here we have, for example, the Edictum Langobardorum, so it was actually Rotary's edict with the various ads of uh, several Longobard kings, and I think possibly also something later, um, and the Capitulare Italicum, that was instead the collection of all the Capitula, that were the laws, emanated for the Italic kingdom, that essentially were the uh, conquered Longobard uh, ones of the Uranium Longobardorum proper uh, from the side of Carolingian sovereigns and eventually uh, by the, the uh, Saxon Ottonians and even by their successors on the Holy Roman Empire tr uh, or Holy Roman Imperial throne up to Emperor Henry II. Right, so actually in the same 11th century. Just for saying among other things, how even the Ottonians that had ruled in Italy up to the last century had actually kept using, these were Saxons, right? They, they were Saxons and Franconians, but when they come in Italy, they keep ruling through the long, local Longobard law that is updated, and because it worked, it worked, that's the point. And you you don't find you rarely find laws that work so long historically speaking in this context right especially in this kind of institutionalized form right because one thing is saying okay well this is a kind of um, primitive society that uh, you know had always had the customary law and it's passed down generation by generation and society doesn't change that much it, it's kind of always the same right it's it's normal that you have this continuity. But Italy, between the Carolingian conquest and now the, the Gregorian reforms, now it's, it's massively changed. And still, Longobard law actually worked up to this point, which actually speaks for the enormous effectiveness of, of, of that system. That, in fact, we, we, we know from the way it was applied that I it was extremely useful and effective and functional, right? So, the studying of... Actually, uh, I forgot to say that the Capitolari Italicum was updated up to the age of Henry III, not Henry II. So, Henry III ruled in the Holy Roman Empire between 1039 and 1056. So, we're basically at the eve of the, of the Gregorian reforms. After three years, it was the Dictatus Pape, for example. So we're talking about the same context here. There is a massive continuity here in, in the picture that has to be understood. And as a consequence, actually the re, um, the Edictum Reg, actually the, the title of the Longobard Edict is the Edictum Regum Longobardorum because it's the Edict of the Longobard Kings, right, of Kings of, of the Longobards literally here, and of the Capitulare Italicum. And this work was known, the sum of these two works, was known as the Liber Papiensis, right? Uh, this is a very important text that has survived uh, up to us in, um, in versions that are generally enriched by glosses and other adaptations. The most important of these versions is the Vulgata, hmm? that constitutes, in fact, the... Mm, more widespread version 
But there is also another very important one that is the so-called Gual Causina, because it's attributed to the Pavese jurist Gual Causius or Gual Causus, that is characterized by the insertion in the comments um, to the text, because these texts were commented, like the two laws, the Longobard and Frankish ones, as an integrating part of the same. What does this mean? It means basically that Italy had had Longobard law as a national character, then you had the Carolingian capitularies added to it. So what these jurists began to do is that they put this law together and they start commenting it like the glossists would do in later, in fact, Roman tradition uh, during the Middle Ages. They're doing the very exact thing. It would happen with Roman law later on. But they were doing it with Longobard and Frankish laws. So it's at this point that you have the addition of Roman elements, as I say. Right? And, and this is what transformed the thing. Because, for example, in, in the second half of the 11th century, the text of the Longobard Frankish law was inserted into this uh, further collection, the so called Lex Langobarda or Lombarda, which witnesses actually that even the Frankish capitularies had been absorbed now as part of the local Italic law, right? And the um, while the Liber Papiensis, which means, by the way, the, the Book of Pavia essentially. Pavia had been the Longobard capital, that also were from the Carolingian themselves, had ruled, etc. It also went destroyed over time. It was central, a very important center of studies, as we'll see now. Um, well, the Liber Papiensis presented the, mm, the content in a chronological order. What happened with the Lombarda instead is that now the content was ordered in a systematic form. So this means that these guys were starting to think in quite sophisticated terms. These were making of all the system in something organic, which wasn't supposed to be so. Because the Longobard law is literally like a list of laws. In an addition, like king after king, you know, some kings didn't make laws, others did, more or less. They were all very good law makers. The Longobards had terrific law makers. Um, but the Carolingian capitularia were, were literally the same, like they were a law after another. So it was the, 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 fir the Liber Papiensis had simply like united these two things, but kind of put them in chronological order. And it's obvious that those single laws were essentially meant to cope with contingent situations. They could be more or less structural. Right, but they still had a general, in fact, syst systemic functionality. But they weren't thought as a system proper. Like it's obvious that when they were emanated, they were part of a system that already existed because laws remained in force. Like the, when you you emanated them as a royal authority. But now, what the um, the Italian jurists do is that they take all of this and they start to make it a system out of it. Right, to make it work as if this had to discipline now kind of more complex thing. So they start to interpret this stuff. And that's why, you know, in the Liber Pienses you also have the comment in this stuff, the gloss proper. Right? It's very step forward step forward in European juridical tradition. And um, also in the last decades of the eleventh century the notes and the comments to the Liber Papiensis found an articulated and complete form in this other work known as the Expositio ad Librum Papiensum, which in Latin means the um, essentially the exposition to the Pavese books, right? And this was a massive, like it was a mm, massive exegetic apparatus right, that uh, reproduced the interpretation of the text elaborated by several generations of jurists. Now this is even more important, like it means that not only was a system at the attempt of making of that law of, of Germanic origin a systematic uh, one, but also that were generations of jurists who worked and studied on this stuff.
So you see that when you, you know, if, if you tell the story without saying, you know, at one point, you know, Roman law popped out magically in Italy out of the blue in the 11th century, and you don't take in consideration what was happening there under this regard, you, you also fail to understand the much that there was this Frankish, Longobard Frankish law still functioning. Um, in that there was this massive intellectual activity now developing from that hadn't existed before in these places in Western Europe. There was nothing like that. But at that point you can't even understand what Roman law was r recovered for. And you need to support the idea by thinking, ah, you know, they needed to essentially to make things work back once again, right? You know, they were simply trying essentially to integrate uh, a more uh, d developed and complex amount of knowledge to actually fix their own law, which was not erasing it. Like, actually, the Italian jurists would conceptually think like when they fully recovered as humanists at that point the Roman law and saying ah this is the single most beautiful thing ever existed this is our law right and there are definitely interesting developments under this regard actually since the 11th century conceptually speaking um, first of all before passing to that so first of all who is that actually made this work uh, in terms of the compilation of the Liber Papiensis and the Expositio that we have man described. So we think, th these are hypotheses, but we think essentially there was a school of law active in Pavia, so the former capital of the kingdom, because now the kingdom was kind of, you know, polycentric in many ways. It was not even a kingdom. Like, uh, after the beginning of the 11th century, um, the Italic kingdom as such, like, it always existed. Hell, it existed even up to Napoleon, basically, but it um, it didn't have a monarchy. <laughs> it had, mm, you know, after the Longbirds, actually after the, the, the Carolingians, the, it hadn't quite had one concretely. Like, the Ottonians did rule from Italy, but it was always kind of pretty, pretty, a torment, <laughs> pretty, pretty tormented experience. But let's say at this point, even a properly the attempt of an, Ita of an it Italic monarch to rise, which happened uh, against the late Ottonians, is is aborted basically, because it's actually the same cities that do not care about this anymore, and that's what the communes incidentally are basically being born as autonomous city states. Um, but Pavia was still a very important administrative center, a city that was provided with this past grandeur, and we can't imagine of a, a continuity in, tra in juridical traditions in this regard. Um, and it's th this theory is supported by the fact that when w sources talk about the liber papiensis, the expositis, etc., they talk about these disputes, um, referred actually to the anonymous author of the Expositio, specifically, uh, between antiquissimi, antiqui, and moderni masters, which means, in Latin, basically, you know, the most the, the, there, is a, there was a segmentation now that, that, that these uh, mm, Italians saw in basically modern masters that were evidently the ones of their generations the an the old ones the antiqui which we don't know what they actually were in the antiqui so we, we don't actually realize what what this means if they're talking actually about the i mean of uh, the longer birds or, or the romans of other generations we, we can't actually realize that but but what is important about this statement is that it was a continuity it was a perceived continuity about what the juridical traditions had been, so it's a, it, it it actually the the most important center in this regard that could have had the kind of continuity, knowing especially from from longer times, so it's definitely Pavia it was the seat of the royal tribunal, where they they solved cases from all over the kingdom, right, and it was actually the um, like the 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 last seat of judgment like if if you you could everything could pass through that and whatever was said that it was the king himself stating it so even in longer times there were actually 
a lot of jurists, and we know because we have documents from, from the Pavia Tribunal at the time, the royal one. I mean. um, so naturally, at this point, we there wasn't just a school of law. There was in, in Pavia itself. It's likely that there was um, a, a, liberal, a school of liberal arts, right? But it's possible that this rediscovery um, started from the actual school of liberal arts and was urged. Uh, within the city by the activity of the same Palatin Tribunal, which still worked, right? It was still active next to the Royal Palatium, right? It was the, um, it was called as the Supreme Court of the Italian Kingdom, probably at this time it actually wasn't like that, it didn't work like that anymore, there wasn't that capacity of reaching, like from Pavia, there wasn't a stable power, a, a seigniory or something that could extend it over the kingdom. That's why the monarchy had failed there. But locally speaking, the center was was still active, and the Palatium is um, in, in all the Romano-Germanic kingdoms is actually the symbol of the continuity with the Roman institution. S the Palatium is is a massive building for the time, built in stone, and that's where you keep a lot of stuff, treasures, uh, these documents, uh, uh, so things that matter for administration proper. And this was not of Germanic origin, but of Roman one. Um, and naturally, when the Germans settled down in these countries, they start mixing with the local resources that are partly Roman, but they basically have to rule uh, through this, like through an institution that, that already exists, and that's how it had always been working, right? With all the changes, of course, throughout time, but the, the center of power, and especially the idea that this was in a city, tribunals were in cities here, right, and they worked, and they had a Britain tradition, a Britain culture. Other ages of Europe didn't quite have this. In Northern Europe, most stuff was still oral, largely, right? Th these areas had basically never lost literacy as a form of, uh, of regular, you know, in the administrative forms, in, in the recording of, mm, of, of knowledge and, and stuff. Um, so, relatively to the fact that these Im achievements have happened in Pavia or not, there are there is a actually a lot of debate. We we don't clearly know. Like there were other cities that could easily pr produce this. After all, it's Bologna that would emerge as the main juridical center, not just in Italy but all over Europe. So, and that city didn't quite have, as far as you know, much of a previous tradition, a uh, juridical tradition. Um, but this is not important. Um, the important, though, is um, that the anonymous author of the Expositio offered a clear witness of the knowledge from the side, in, in that case of Pavis masters, not only of the most recent, but also of the oldest juridical works of Justinian, of the institutions, of the Codex of the Epitome Juliani, and of the Digestion but also, and especially, of their use and reading and in commenting the Longobard Frankish laws. This is the great mix. They were starting using Roman law again to comment and to integrate, to integrate it, actually, within the same Germanic law. Um, and the let's say, the use of Justinian text for the interpretation of Germanic law was justified by the author of the Expositio on the base of the special nature of Roman law that he himself, in his work, defined, here, here, Lex Omnium Generalis. This is a statement of massive import. It basically means the the, the let's say the general the, the common the, the general law the common law of all of all people this is a massive statement because basically the Pavese lawyers declared to recognize the Roman juridical tradition as the common matrix of the most different um, and multiform customs that were in force in central northern Italy, such an important matrix uh, as the Longobard um, Frankish tradition 
that could in turn mm, use profitably its own contribution. So I, I know if maybe for if you've heard here this topics for s first time you but the 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 enormity of this statement is incredible like after centuries that these law germanic laws had been basically the mainstream it was the the normal public law it was a public law right you 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 knocked at the longobard pal at the royal palace in pavia and you said king i please hear me and the the case was actually settling there, right? And so that was public law for everybody, right? And maybe here we haven't explained how Roman customs survived in part in some areas, how uh, the Carolingian conquest uh, brought together even s some Roman elements because they basically occupied Byzantine areas that Longbers actually had occupied shortly afterwards. Um, I mean before and therefore had mixed a little bit things right so it wasn't completely like it was just germanic law and nothing else it, it was a bit of a mix in this regard um and especially in fact for s economical transactions i mean roman law was m more dynamic i mean roman customs proper so not the one of the code th the law of the codes but what had been chewed and transformed and and and, and buried uh, through the years in lands that had maintained this Roman customs but had lost actually the Roman law yeah, as a book, right? Um, and anyhow, that was the thing. There was the public law of the kingdom. Here we're talking about a kingdom proper. No kidding here. Here, even if there was, it wasn't an actual king, especially in this time, the law was recognized as a public one within the Italic kingdom within the Holy Roman Empire. In this case, as a specific Italic thing, in the sense that this was the national law of Italy, perceived as such, and used as such. Well, at this point, these guys start recovering Roman law, and they say, you know what? These were people that would c consider themselves as still as Longobards, essentially. And I would say, you know what? Roman law, at this point, actually serves as a base for all the rest. Like, they didn't erase the Longobard Frankish tradition, but they said, you know, this thing can work literally for everyone. Now, this stuff happened, basically, th this notion of Roman law as right common to all seems to be um, datable to the second half of the 11th century, on the wake of this cultural direction that, according especially to the most recent uh, studying of the Lex Romana Visigotorum, which was the, the Visigothic law in Spain, as a text of common law, right, that, that in Spain had worked essentially both for the Roman and the Gothic nations, meant in, as the Naciones in, in Latin, that obviously is different from today's term, would have found essentially an expression ever since the first wave of, of Germanic invasions. Right, we haven't talked on Schwerpunkt yet about the uh, the Burgundian and the Visigothic laws, but essentially, especially the Visigothic one was the closest it got, essentially, to the Romanization of a Germanic law in the Iberian Peninsula, and um, and this worked for reasons now, essentially, unlike Italy, that with the Longobard invasion after the Gothic War that had raised all the previous st structures was massively Germanized in political, institutional, and juridical practice. Basically, in Spain, uh, Roman society had remained essentially intact. So basically, when the, Go the Goths arrived there, they they had their own law, but they, they basically codified it from, from the oral tradition in a way that had great Roman influences and uh, at that point it was meant not as just the laws of the of the Germans but as lo the law a bit of, a, of all the subjects of the Visigothic kingdom which was a very different thing the Longobards actually did a similar thing in the sense that the Longobards arrived in an Italy where they could easily say okay I conquered hence you you are under Germanic law at the same time that's why for example in, in Longobard Italy you don't have Romans quoted most most of the times in juridical treatises and 
ancient Germanists believed that this was something like that basically all the Romans were uh, enslaved and that they didn't even appear in, in social contracts, in law, etc. Um, this thing has been rejected by at least 60 years as far as I know and it simply means that basically every time had become a Longobard juridically in the Italic Kingdom. Um, this is very important and it, it would actually uh, prove with these 11th century developments that what had happened to these, uh, these two southern European uh, regions, Spain and Italy, was somewhat comparable at the juridical level. Now, of course, uh, Spain at this point was under largely under the, the Muslims, so the, the thing is different. Uh, Italy was was different in this regard. It was framed. It was a kingdom. It uh, was framed under the Holy Roman Empire. The south was in part, of course, Byzantine, and then Sicily was uh, technically being conquered by uh, I mean by the Normans from the Muslims here. But the the core of Italy, uh, the center in the north, was functioning still like w without discontinuity for longer about times, institutionally speaking. So. Um, this is very interesting because it proves that I in a land that, as we have seen before, was Longobard, because Italy was still called in the 11th century uh, Regnum Longobardorum, right? The the terms um, Italia was was appearing as such, but abroad these guys were known as Longobards still, and they still felt like like that. But in in spite of this, these jurists were taking back Roman law and saying you you know what, this works for everything in practice. Like, we, I mean, in theory, still, at this point, because the practice would arrive just with the massive development of Roman law by the Bolognese studium later on. But this thing was Im uh, already perceived, in fact, in Latin, as the lex omnium generalis, the law common for everybody, so that ideally speaking, this thing was still perceived, and not because these people were uh, nostalgic of ancient Rome, it had nothing to do with that, that begins with humanism, uh, centuries later. Um, they, uh, they were doing in that, essentially because it, it truly worked in some instances, right? so th what that's what these jurists were, were actually interested in. And of course, they had also other interests, I mean, historical, other, but, you know, we, we're still in a somewhat primitive situation in which the most important thing here is is to make things work, not to like speculate too much about the the ancients, the things that comes at the end of the Middle Ages, right? This is very important, very very important, and it shows uh, the the Visigothic laws is is a great ex example, but even in eleventh century Italy, basically you realize that the significance of Roman law as uh, law, uh, com uh, common law to all the resident populations in a determined territory would be different, very different actually, from the one defined by low medieval jurisprudence. In fact, low medieval jurisprudence would actually accredit Roman law as a sort of universal and superior authority, which is a very different thing. At that point, actually, the, the big problem is, uh, I mean, the problem in general, how the thing had evolved is it was an, in a univer universalistic perspective. Like, it was in the mindset, in the frame of the Holy Roman Empire. It wasn't felt as, like, what Italians do in their own kingdom. It was about, like, we should extend this to the whole universe, in theory. Right? It should work for the Holy Roman Empire, should work for other aspects. The church is complicated now because it had developed in turn its own law, basically, that it also it was Roman influence, but it was essentially a different thing. Um, so, mm, there is a, a, a wholly different mindset behind this, because in, in the low Middle Ages, Roman law, by the Bolognese tradition, became almost uh, sacral, right? While the, the Pavese jurists of the 11th century, more simply, more concretely, were essentially stating that the the customs that had imposed in their own territory presented common roots and that these roots were constituted by Roman law. Now this is very important also for another reason because if when you look at the Longobard law you say essentially well 
This is a Germanic law, absolutely, cent for cent, but from a formal way. Like, this is the Germanic king that emanates laws in the name of his own people in arms with the assembly of armed warriors that shake spears on, on their shields, literally. That is how it literally is in the edict. But it's obvious that, f first of all, the first f the, the fact that the Longobards brought their their lows down in Italy, and we know it, it actually was thanks to actual Romance uh, scholars that inhabited in, you know, pre Longobard Italy of Byzantine or Roman or Italic tradition, whatever you want to call it, and and it's obvious that the that's not what you know a, a type of law that literally comes from 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 Central Europe, right? It's a, a already a more advanced one. It has to cope with the reality of Italy. The edictum was created after in, in 643, so essentially two or three generations after the settlement of the Longobards in Italy, right? And in a context was completely different from the, the even the original mindset. I mean, completely maybe not, but very different from the from the, the ideal of the original people that didn't even conceive to have a kingdom, leaving aside territory uh, territorialized one, one that ruled from and from the cities, etc. So something very different as well. In spite of all, the Longobard Kingdom is actually the best preserved Germanic law that we we have, right? One of the mo th actually the oldest in practice because the others were written down much later in a context in which, of course, they had differed. So, actually, the the Longobard Edict is probably the close is l yeah the closest we get to actual Germanic law at, at that extensive level of of um, of use on of evidence of documented material etc so it's of dramatic importance right very different even from the Frankish laws in many ways but maybe we will see this on another occasion um, so but thinking about the power of the, the statement of the Lex Omnium Generalis it, it's r literally like mind-blowing so uh, the the other point we must specify though is that even if Roman law was now perceived by this specific jurist in his work as the common matrix of the customs mat mat matured in those regions right this didn't actually mean that the Roman law was perceived as the unique matrix here because basically next to the Roman tradition operated also the Longobard and Frankish one so there was actually a very um, sound connection between these two traditions in in this context. I mean that that seems to be further co confirmed by two works that actually use the Justinian texts and the Longobard Frankish alike. Now these two works are known as the Excep uh, Exceptiones Petri and the Brachilogus Iuris Civilis. The first one, uh, the title which, uh, the complete title which is Petri Viri Dissertissimi Exceptiones Legum Romanarum, is born out of the union of two collections in turn. The Tubingen book, that is a manuscript preserved in Tubingen in southwestern Germany, and the Ashburnham book that is being found in a, a, a London manuscript that is actually uh, that is at this point uh, part of Lord uh, Ashburnham's uh, library, a very, very f important famous, and that um, collects the passages of the institutions of the Codex um, of the Epitome Juliani, of the, the Gestum, together with fragments of the Edict of Rotary and Frankish Capitulary. So you have all these parts of the Roman law, of the Justinian Code, plus the Longobard and Frankish laws. And at, at this point you realize that at the time, in actual practice, Roman, Longobard and Frankish law were used all together. Right in this work, um, according to you know several scholars, should be dated back to to the 11th century and to have been composed within the Italic Kingdom. 
and also the Brachylogus Juris Civilis, that is a more systematic work of, of, of the previous, actually, uh, contains certain passages of the Justinian collections as well, including the Digestum, and together with um, uh, fragments of the Capitula Reitalicum, so of the Frankish Capitularies, and surprise, surprise, of the Lex Romana Visigotorum. Yes, they were using in Italy parts of the Visigothic law. It was from Spain, right? And in, in, a, in a context where, you know, that kingdom that which had emanated, th that didn't exist anymore. Um, there were actually lots of Spanish refugees from, from Spain uh, after the, um, the, the, the Muslim invasions in to Italy that brought together with them, we know it could ecologically, polygraphically, their, their own manuscripts of the Visigothic laws and customs, etc. And, and it's dramatically interesting that in, in 11th century Italy you find Italian jurists studying Roman, Frankish, Longobard and Visigothic laws. Right, we've seen before there was even the Ostrogothic law, like there were certain fragments of the Edictum Theoderici, so effectively that was an Italic law as well, because it was at the time of uh, Theodoric when he ruled Italy. So you, you, the important thing here is rather, like think of putting all of this stuff together. What, what do you have? Is it is a much more complicated system that you need kind of more intellectual, and uh, literacy and uh, juridical s skills, theoretical and practical alike, to make function together. These guys weren't just you know picking stuff and fitting it all in the same codex. Just saying, oh look, we have collected them all. No, they, w they were actually studying them. They were using them in court. People were judged like this. Um, cases were settled through the studying of these works. I mean, this is impressive. Right, and you do not find this in the rest of Europe. You don't. That's the massive difference. You d there is not a, a parallel to this everywhere else. That's the reason why the, the, the Germans actually, the next century, arrive in Italy. The first thing they, they realize is these guys actually can write massively compared to the rest of the population. They were telling it at, at the, the German king, saying, you know, we should do what, what those guys are doing there. There, there is an actual letter to this because they were realizing especially in the optic of a German kingdom they were trying to build in the 12th century like we should use what those guys use because that works that helps to to actually deliver to dispense justice to, to make things work to administrate to make mm, contracts work this started chiefly from economy right this is an important thing I mean you you need to settle matters chiefly because of money problems. Let's be honest about that. It's about damage. It's about how much you lose economically speaking. And 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 the reason why it develops in in these uh, in this area of Europe is that because Italy was of course at the center of the revival of traffics um, and of the enormous interests that were accumulating in this area. So this is. Um, Incredible. The Brachylogus Iuris Civilis, by the way, is, uh, is datable to the Italic Kingdom, according to the majority of scholars, in fact, to the end of the 11th century. So, um, this is really big as a topic. I don't know how, you know how many of you will actually follow this till the end, but I would like to make you understand the enormity of this topic. I mean, the 11th century reveals itself to be this period of major cultural ferment and uh, of meaningful economical revival. The Justinian collections were therefore rediscovered. They knew um, the first reconstructions and the first studying as essentially the deliverers of a law capable to provide a solid legitimization um, both to the 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 pretty massive forts and you know gigantic objectives of the R Gregorian ref of the Reformed Church who wanted basically to dominate all of Europe, um, ecclesiastically speaking, and to negotial activity, the renewed negotial uh, activity. And 
it's in this within this this context that um, of revival of Justinian law that the role of the digest of the digestion uh, began to emerge right more more clearly because this was the part of of the Justinian in a law that essentially expressed uh, the techniques and form of juridical interpretation and that for this reason could provide those elements to proceed for the orderly reading of the new praxis, the new juridical praxis. And that's how you can find, for example, in in, in the in Ma Marturi, which is a, a town in near to Siena, right? That was part of the Italic Kingdom. In 1076, mm -hmm. of a placitum in which was quoted a passage from Ulpianus on the Restitutio in Integrum, right, uh, con contained in the digestion, and over which was founded the decision of the popular court. This example is, is, is massive because you realize in a town near Siena, in the 11th century, these guys were quoting Roman law now at a popular level. This is incredible. Um, I can't stop, <laughs> you know, amazing myself of reading this stuff because it's, um, th that's big. And I hope you, you know, at least I hope I was able to explain you decently this if you if you had never heard of it, and that it can make you reflect on what the Middle Ages have really been uh, uh, at a such an early date that is normally conceived as, yeah, we were the midst of the Middle Ages, was just a bunch of brutal, illiterate, uh, unsophisticated work. These guys were quoting Roman law in a popular court that was deciding on the base of this knowledge. Ju just saying, <laughs> by the way. So, yeah, I think this is all for today, and we will naturally continue with um, this journey into medieval law. And these are the things that really matter to me, right? I, I think that aside from the popular, th there is not even a popular idea of what medieval law was actually was. I, I think that there is. I I can't think of uh, anything. It's not stereotypizations, you know, punishments, or, you know, but um, this was actual legal practice in 11th century Europe, right? Not all of it, but still there, right? And that's important. So if you have some memory in your in your cerebral hard disk, maybe try to store a little bit of it, because it can be useful. Um, Alright, so I think for today we stop here, and I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like, or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents, and for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.